Right. Welcome everyone. We we made it <laughs> into our session. Um, I'm gonna just wait another 30 seconds to see if folks uh will continue to uh, trickle in. Um, and then we can get started uh, in just a minute or so. As a reminder, uh, before we get started, the chat um, and the uh, Q&A are available. If you do want to make comments or ask questions, I'll be kind of moderating the session uh, as we talk to our two panelists today. Um, so thanks everyone for joining uh, our session on interdisciplinary insights into fostering student engagement in course readings. Um, today joining us, we have uh, Ma Mariana Laporte, an associate professor of biology from Eastern Michigan University and Katie Pierce, an associate professor of communication from University of Washington. Uh, so both of them use hypothesis in their courses, and we're just going to have a conversation about how they use it um, and, you know, what successes they seen from it and, you know, maybe what they want to try in the future. So we'd love to hear from you through the session as well. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can see all of our lovely faces here. Um, and if we could just start with intros. Um, I know I just said kind of generally what you teach, but uh, do each of you mind sharing just uh, more specifically in, uh, about the course you use hypothesis in? What kind of course is it? How big is it? What uh, modality are you teaching? Details like that. Um, do you mind starting us off, Katie? Sure. Thanks. Well, hi, everyone. And it's great to be here with everybody. And uh, Christine knows I love nerding out about hypothesis, so it's good to be doing it with all of you. Um, so I'm at the University of Washington in the Department of Communication, and I myself am a technology and society researcher. I mostly work on uh, using technology for repression and authoritarian states, but I don't teach on that that much. I usually teach more like tech and society seminars. I also teach a lot of research methods, as I'm sure many of you do have a rotation that you teach methods. Um, and for me, I generally teach uh, classes of either 45 alone or 100 plus with TAs, um, you know, and then TAs as the class gets more TAs as the class gets larger. I've been teaching a lot of uh, remote courses in recent years. As you may recall, there was a global pandemic. Um, but uh, now I am back in the classroom and still using Hypothesis, even though it was really sort of a pandemic thing for me initially. I just love it so much. So, um, yeah. So love to talk with everybody about this. Great, thanks. Um, and I'm sorry, I forgot, I realized I didn't introduce myself to everyone that's here. Uh, my name is Christy and I work with Hypothesis, so I'm a customer success manager here. So I'm happy to bring Katie and Mariana along uh, to talk about how they use social annotation in their teaching. Um, so Mariana, do you mind sharing the same thing, just kind of more background about uh, the courses in which you use Hypothesis? Sure, I'm happy to do that. Um, I've only been using Hypothesis for a year or so now, so I didn't use it in the pandemic, um, but it came to our campus and I jumped on it right away. Uh, actually, at first I didn't really recognize how it could be useful, but then I had a couple light bulbs go on in a training session and um, started using it in an intro bio lecture of about 100 people. Um, where I co-teach with another faculty member, but we don't have any TAs or 100, 120 or so um, in there. And then I also used it in a, a lab setting where uh, the, I have a bunch of TAs who are actually teaching the class. So I coordinate the lab and they're teaching. I uh, used it extensively in there and then um, planning to use it this summer in a remote class. Uh, a cell biology class that I'll, will be much smaller, uh, more like 30 or so, and it'll just be me in there. Great. Wow. So it sounds like there's a lot to dig in. There's lots of different modalities, lots of different course sizes and subjects and labs and not labs. And um, so that'll be exciting. Um, so 
It's interesting because Katie, you mentioned you started, you know, using hypothesis during uh, the remote teaching and, and Mariana kind of came at it from a, a different angle. What motivated you to start using hypothesis? Were you hoping to solve a particular problem or it was, you know, was there something else that kind of just inspired you to try it? Uh, Mariana, since you're a little bit newer to using the tool, why don't we start with you for this one? What motivated me to use it? Um, so, you know, I, I started using it with um, one of the very first things I did with it was this long, complicated semester um, assignment that we have that has a bunch of different parts to it that we've written up assignment sheets for. And I had written up an overview and I thought that it was beautifully clear. Um, and, and then I had this, you know, I thought, okay, well, I could try out having them annotate this, the overview assignment um, in groups. And, you know, then they'll understand the assignment better and it'll be great. And I read through very carefully all of the comments that they made. And it was just this sort of wow moment of I can see what they're thinking. You know, they were asking questions of one another, like, what do you guys think, you know, <laughs> they mean by this and, and that sort of thing. So it really helped to clarify where their sticky spots were. And so one of the first sets of things I started doing was really having them annotate rubrics, annotate, you know, things that we had created to, to, to start to see where their thinking was and, and then uh, try to communicate better with them. Um, around sort of the things we were creating and their understanding of them. Oh, that's super interesting. So the majority of the documents that you started out with uh, having them annotate are kind of just like your ancillary course documents, like course instruction, uh, project instructions and and rubrics and things like that. Yeah, those were the first things that that really were sort of the, ooh, I get a chance to see what they're thinking about our um, assignments in a, in an interactive way because I felt like they really built on one another instead of you know when you do it in in class you get a few hands um, and you know if you do it more in a reflection kind of format then you get meh, whatever they thought of the first time kind of on their own and whereas when they're doing it together then they build on one another they try and answer each other's questions sometimes in the right way sometimes in in a way that's revealing a, a, of a sort of a misunderstanding. And so, yeah, that was the first thing. And then I moved on to a bunch of different other kinds of assignments and other kinds of things to have them annotate. Yeah, that's uh, that's really interesting because typically we hear, you know, folks using it with uh, more traditional course materials like a reading or an academic paper. Um, Katie, what about you? Do you find yourself gravitating more towards those more traditional course readings in your use of hypothesis? What were your original goals in using the tool? Yeah, I mean, I we all know for the last whatever four or five years has just been really difficult for all of us as educators. Going remote, dealing with all of the various challenges that we as the instructors and our students have been facing. And then in the last couple of years, AI coming in, it's been incredibly, I do not need to tell anyone that is here how difficult things have been for the last few years. And so initially it was like, how can I be having this semblance of interactivity? And I had done discussion boards like, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, briefly once. And it was sort of like, nah. And I'm actually very excited to go to the uh, panel. I think it's later today, the death of the, the discussion board. Um, and so I had heard from a couple of friends, oh, that we had this really great experience. And I saw I'm in a lot of like mom, professor, Facebook groups. People were like, oh, we love hypothesis. And I was like, all right, I'm going to give it a shot. And I started it out. We were speaking about this earlier about trying things out in the summer. When we teach summer classes, I tried it out in the summer and I was blown away. And I immediately signed up for Hypothesis Academy, which I cannot recommend more to everybody. Um, I did an AI focused one and then I did a general one. And so you have this community of other people that are all going through the material at the same time you are. And so you can really bounce ideas off of each other. And so I basically like built out my entire structure based on what I was learning in academy and just in interacting. I like I still keep in touch with a lot of people from my academy class group cohort. Um, so that was really great. And since then, for my content-based classes, I tell students, I'm like, we're sort of in a, like a book club, a reading club. 
we are going to really engage with this material. And that's going to be the primary way that you are going to be evaluated in this course is your engagement with this material and with your group members with this material. Um, it's a different way to think about the course. Um, but if you're keen on that, come join us. And so some students were like, I don't want to be held accountable in this very visible way. But for those who want to be, they love it. They love it because they're like, as Mariana said, you can see them thinking as they're going through it. And um, they, I'm sure some of them do, but from all the feedback I've received, they don't find it tedious. And so it's them interacting with the material, but also that I'm guiding them through the material. And I have some examples I can show a little later if anyone wants to see like different ways that you can like explain things that you know that they won't understand um, or uh, be like, hey, this links back to the thing we talked about a few weeks ago. So it's really changed everything for me. I, I can't even fathom going back because it's like not just like, hey, here's the assigned reading, let's hope for the best. It's like everybody is in it in a way that I couldn't have imagined otherwise. So yeah, I I am not being a uh, paid sponsor for Hypothesis saying these things. I truly believe this. <laughs> Uh, thanks for sharing, Katie. Yeah, I think uh, between COVID and now AI, like, I feel like we are constantly trying to reinvent teaching and hypothesis kind of just helps us get back to like, know what's what is teaching and learning actually like getting back to the roots of that. Um, I think you have mentioned a couple interesting things about um you know, getting the students to annotate and guiding the students on your own. Um, so how, and we can start with Katie with this question and then go back to you, Mariana. How do you instruct students in in their annotations and what kind of guidance do you provide them? Um, do you think that it is important, like your guidance is important in getting them to have like a quality conversation about the text? Yes. And I will say I learned in Hypothesis Academy about the 3 to one method, which I will never turn back. So the 3 to one method is, is that the students, it's not just like, here's the PDF, go for it. It's saying, all right, in this document, you need to annotate three things you learned, two things that confirmed what you already knew, and ask one question. So that's 3 to one It's very easy for them to remember. And you have them do a hashtag tag confirmed question learned. And so um, it makes it very easy for you as the instructor to like navigate through that, to like find their question, et cetera. And so they are reading with a purpose because they're doing those things. Um, certainly some students will still do kind of annotations that aren't part of three, two, one, but um, most of them do three, two, one. Now I will say in some of my other classes, if I'm doing like, I, I'm doing this for a content-based act class. If it's a particular assignment, it's, you know, something where it'd be like, wait, what's the, uh, what's the sample of this study? Or like, what's the independent variable? Like there could be something different that I give them more direction, but for the content, the three, two, one really works. Um, and I have now tacked on like a, a, an additional that it's like, and you must reply to a classmate meaningfully. But yeah, that system, I think made it go from just like, the author says that blah, 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 to them actually making connections. Um, I further give them instructions about that, what a good annotation looks like. And I can show, I do this little, um, thing that is called the um, hypothesis highlight of the week. Go down to the bottom. So when I see them in person live, I pull out like the best one. And then I do these little post-its that I point out what they did well. Um, and for the class, they have the name. Now I will say students will start messaging you privately begging to be, hey, don't forget to look at mine on the Smith reading. Like it, we <laughs> might make a good one. They, they, they get a little competitive about it. 
Um, but it's really nice that you can flag for them what a good annotation looks like. Um, here's some other ones. Like this one, it was with a reply. You know, it's like relevant connection to material from another course, fun link to current trend, summary of own perspective, an invitation for others, what you think. And so um, this, I think, was fun to do. They, they seem to really like it. Um, and so from the get-go, being able, like every week, being like, this is what a good annotation is, um, sets a really high standard that is a good thing. Um, so yeah, that it, it is fun to be able to do. You just also don't be like me. The first time I did it, I wasn't keeping track. And then I was like, oh gosh, I think I've done Joshua like four times now. So keep track of who you <laughs> pull out. Who you highlight. Oh, I love yes. the idea of hypothesis highlight of the week. I think that's, in my experience, students often um, you know, gravitate towards summarizing content. And this is a really great way to provide them in, of examples of how you can not just summarize content. Um, so thanks for so much for sharing that. Um, so Mariana, I know you mentioned someone in the chat asked for a clarification. Um, when you're having students annotate assignments, you mean that they're annotating the assignment instructions that you have shared with them, right? Okay. Yeah, in, the, in that case, I I have. I haven't had them um, annotate uh, one another's actual work product, although that's a, a good idea. I'm getting all kinds of good ideas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do have them do some peer reviewing, and I've just been doing sort of standard Canvas peer review stuff. So having them having them annotate uh, their peer reviewed assignments would be kind of cool. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, are, I, I'm not sure how much you have ventured into using hypothesis for other for other goals beyond annotating assignments and rubrics and things. But what have you found has led to the most meaningful conversations with your students? How do you how do you kind of prompt them to annotate? Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm going to be tackling that this summer a lot because I'm teaching this online cell biology class. So so it will be I am going to use an open source textbook and have them really annotating content uh, and I want to be in there with them so I'll be trying that out. I have though had them annotate other kinds of um, things like uh, really some compelling like TED talk kinds of things about global climate change and you know sort of evolution in the Anthropocene and and that sort of thing and because that content is compelling enough I really I found that they just took off with it without, you know, I mean, I'm really glad to hear Katie's ideas about, you know, and, and the 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 um, academy, you know, to hear about that, because I haven't been that formalized about what I asked for. But they were just so compelled by the material that they started adding on, oh, this is like, you know, this is like that, that other thing that I've learned about, and they were adding links to papers they'd read and and other kinds of things and just going, wow, I can't believe, you know, the way that this guy is is putting this together. And so, you know, without me doing much of anything, they've really um, connected to, to some of this material and then started to connect it to, to really what we're doing in the class um, because they were able to go. And I mean, I had students who were really checking back in, you know, I asked them, you know, say three things <laughs> basically. And I had students who were going back in and checking on it. And I mean, I remember discussion boards from back teaching online back in the day and yeah, people would get done and well, they're done. And and here they really didn't have to, but they still went back and, and added on to the conversation and were really interested, I think, in what their fellow students were saying. Awesome. I mean, yeah, those things sound uh, you were saying the titles of those things, and I'm like, oh, I want to I want to watch this video. I want to look at this content. So they definitely do seem compelling. Um so Mariana, it sounds like you're, you've kind of just been rolling with hypothesis and, and trying it out. Um, do you feel like it has changed your interactions with your with your students, um, either, you know, depending on your modality of teaching, if, if you're in the face to face class um, or in your online classes and and how has it changed that? Yeah, it's been another way of really getting the students to connect with the the content um, and sort of the the way I'm doing things. So I'm doing uh, specs grading, 
And so we're doing lots of sort of iterative, open-ended uh, questioning of students and getting them into to really look at the written material. So we're you know, because we're grading so much, we're not leaving comments on the things that we're grading. And, and also we have these very detailed rubrics. It's like, well, if you didn't understand how I said it then, it's not really going to help to make a, a comment, but getting them to just annotate the rubric and try and compare what they've said to the rubric, you can see some of, you know, where are their misconceptions? Where is it that that, that particular student needs to, to, to work on in order to get the spec in the next version of the quiz? Great. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, and there's a lot of cool ideas flying around in the chat. So uh, if you all have not been keeping up with the chat, I would definitely check out some of the instructions in there. Um, I know we're kind of sneaking towards the end very quickly, but Katie, I know you have used hypothesis and kind of different creative ways and bring in a lot of multimedia. Do you mind sharing any examples of those things and, and just sharing how how that's worked in your teaching? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I think it's it's um probably one of the best parts of hypothesis is that you can both make it fun, but also it's just like a being able to use this, it's, you can't even imagine until you start playing around with it, you're like, oh, this is so useful. So here's just some examples from my content class. So like here, it's like, you know, you can use like animated GIFs kind of like, or GIFs if you prefer, uh, to kind of make things fun, to draw students attention to different things. Um, you know, you gotta be careful not to date yourself too much, but you know, try your best. Um, here is a really funny one, a student annotated, what is America online? And here was like my reply animated GIF, you know, and then I promptly explained to her what this was. Um, so it's like a nice way to be interacting with your students kind of in a more informal way. Um, one thing I do a lot is if I use an older text and there's more up-to-date statistics, I just put this graphic on the side that's like, you know, this was a good theory piece, but this wasn't up to date on social media use. So um, I do that quite a bit because um, students will ask like, what's now the deal with that? Um, I also started experimenting using canva.com to make infographics. So this um, text referred to a theory that the students probably didn't know. So I made this infographic for the side that kind of gave them the basics of that theory. I'll show another example here. Um, and so, because I know they're not gonna know it. And then this will allow them to be able to engage with the reading more. Um, other examples are like walking students through complex ideas. Like here, this thing we read talked about what is a meta-analysis, what's an umbrella review. I know, I am totally aware that most of them don't know what that means. So I can explain it in the annotations. They can get through the reading. Um, also, like this was a study where we talked about uh, body image and there was an example about how in France, there was like a label on things that were like this image was edited. Students don't know what that looks like. So I just put a graphic in the side. Um, also for more advanced students, the video clips are really great. I haven't experimented with making my own, but this is something I'm gonna work on this summer. So this is, you know, this talk about Judith Butler. I'm like, hey, Here's a quick video and the students that are really keen on it, they'll watch it in hypothesis. Um, also being able to tie back to past concepts and I'll do like an animated GIF to get their attention. Like, hey, do you remember like a couple weeks ago we talked about this? Now, I also want to mention as you're looking at this, it's a lot of work to do these annotations, but because you can export your own annotations, it's like um, if you're doing multiple groups, you can import your, you do the annotations once, and then you import the same set of annotations to all the different groups, or you're teaching it again next term, you export your old annotations, takes a second, and you import them into the new one. So you did this effort once, and you can keep on using it. Um, also, I like being able to like highlight something and be like, hey, you know, please keep this in mind for the assignment you're going to do. 
Um, so yeah, those were all just different things that you can kind of do in your annotations to kind of catch their attention. Um, and like I said, you it seems like a lot of work up front, and it is, but then you're going to use it over and over and over again. Or if you add to some, it's like it's an evolving set of annotations, right? Like if something new happens, you add it. That's your new set to export for next time. Thanks so much for sharing all those ideas, Katie. I teach a gender and technology course and I use hypothesis also. And I have to update everything so because like technology changes. And the idea of adding just updates in annotations with I'm so excited. So thank you for giving yeah, me yeah, the ideas yeah. too. It's, it helps so much, right? <laughs> that, and then you're like, I, this isn't so dated anymore because I can update it. Um, so we're coming down to the last few minutes and the chat has been flying. Um, I know that folks have uh, questions. If you have a question, if you could put it in the Q&A so I could see it there, that would be great. Um, Mariana, would you mind just kind of wrapping us up as we wait for questions with how you might think of using hypothesis in the future, or you mentioned you're going to be using it in your summer class. Are there new ways you're thinking of, of implementing it? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I'm, I'm um, adopting an open source textbook just because I want to use hypothesis and I don't want to be stuck in a publisher's book where I can't do social annotation with them. You know, Cell biology textbooks are encyclopedic. They're huge. They include, you know, incredible amounts of detail about all of these molecular processes, cellular processes. And I really want to be able to focus their attention, explain bits of, of it, you know, get them to actually engage. One thing we see is with the regular textbooks, a lot of times they don't read them. They don't know how to read them. With papers, they don't really know how to read them either. And I want to bring in, you know, primary literature and say, hey, start with this figure instead of, you know, starting at the beginning and ending at the end, which they tend to, you know, tend to want to do. And so I'm I'm excited about the idea of being able to interact with them around the the textbook because so far the textbooks have been, you know, they're usually big and expensive and and too much and <laughs> It's just difficult. So, uh, so I'm I'm really excited about uh, doing that and making it a big part of the course this summer, since it's an asynchronous online course. That's awesome. I I'm really excited to hear how that goes for you, um, especially because yeah, I think sometimes with expensive textbooks, it's like we're kind of discouraging students from doing their reading from the get-go because they have to put out all this extra money, right? So adopting that OER and then adding hypothesis sounds like a golden um, combination. So I haven't seen any Q&A questions come in. Um, I do note, I am going to, I everyone is concerned that they can't copy and paste from the chat right now because there are so many good ideas. I will find a way to send this out to all the attendees. So I'm sorry that that is disabled. We will send the chat out to you. Um, and I also put information about Hypothesis Academy in the chat. I linked to um, the link to join that. I run it. We just started a cohort yesterday, so I can sneak you in if um, you want to join. Uh, you can register there. Um, but yeah, so I want to thank uh, Katie and Mariana again for joining us today. I'm really excited about all the new ideas that I have gotten from this session, and I hope um, everyone in the chat has gotten some new ideas as well. So thanks again for coming and hope to see you in uh, future sessions, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.